Robert Twigger, welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me. So you've written a book called Micromastery, Learn Small, Learn Fast, and Unlock Your Potential to Achieve Anything. So what is a micromastery? A micromastery, well, I've, I've defined it as a, as a self-contained unit of doing. So it's, a, it's something that's complete in itself, but it's connected to the greater field. So that's sort of the abstract version of it. But what it is, it's kind of like the distilled essence of an activity. So I probably, if I give you a few examples, so sure. the, uh, when I started the whole process, I thought about becoming a good cook and that seemed like a daunting task. But then I thought, okay, I knew that as a test piece for your ability as a cook, making a perfect omelet was, was often used. If you went for a job as a chef, they'd ask you to make a, a perfect omelet. So that's, that's the kind of the first micro mastery that I, that I stumbled upon because a, a, an omelet has in it, making it all the skills that you need or almost all the skills that you need for far more complicated kinds of cooking. And so it's that ability to sort of boil something down and something that's repeatable. So you, an omelet only takes a minute or two minutes to make. So you can make an awful lot of them so you can get better, which is important because you need to, to, to repeat in order to practice something. And it needs some kind of payoff. You know, a, a micro mastery is something that, that needs some kind of payoff. So, you know, people, people, you know, it's kind of like the, Hey, wow thing. You've done a trick or you've done something that's pretty cool. If you can do a, a, a 360 on a skateboard, um, people go, oh, oh, that's that's good. And you feel a bit better about yourself. And, and I think people underestimate how much feedback we need when we start learning something. I know when I started doing Aikido, the Japanese martial art, people would say, well, what can you do? And um, at the beginning, I couldn't really do anything. So it didn't feel, it didn't feel like I was learning much. Well, let's talk about the benefits of approaching learning with this micro mastery idea, as opposed to the way most people go about learning. So like, what's the way that most people go about learning a skill and why do you think this micro mastery concept is, is better? Well, if you think back to, to how you probably approach things, I certainly know I have, it's been very haphazard. I often sort of get an idea in my head. Oh yeah, I, I, I'd be great to learn Arabic for example, but I sort of buying a textbook. I don't really go go much beyond that you know maybe i would look up courses i've got a very conventional approach and it's all tinged with boredom i would say that for me the notion of learning having been through the school system it's always got this sort of tinge of boredom about it and so micro mastery was head on wanted to to get rid of that sort of essential boring element that 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 is in learning and it, it doesn't have to really be there so so that's that's really that was the start starting point so once I had worked out that you could really find these micro masteries everywhere, I I looked for things which ha- definitely have a fun element, and and and, and there is kind of something kind of essentially fun about about the way they do it. What I like about the micro mastery approach is that instead of initially going wide in a field, trying to learn everything about it all at once, you first take a small step and then you go upstream. And, and that circumvents a lot of what keeps us from sticking with something where it's too daunting, it's too tedious, and you just give up. Instead, you're having these satisfying little successes that sustain your momentum. Let's talk about some of the more stick into the elements of a mic. What makes a skill a micro mastery skill? So you, you talk about it's like a self contained unit. So like instead of thinking I'm going to become a better cook, I'm going to learn how to cook an omelet would be example. Instead of I'm going to become a learn how to play baseball, it's like well I'm going to learn how to throw the ball like a fastball correctly. Yeah. Um, so these are skills that are self contained. Um, they're repeatable. But let's dig in even further. Like you even, there's like, I think a six part, um, it's like six elements you've laid out of what, like of the components of a micro mastery skill. What are those? Well, what I, I realized is that the, the all micro masteries have what I call, I call it the entry trick. It's some piece of information that once you're in possession of it, it immediately levels you up. And what I discovered is that experts often jealously guard this information and you find it out much later when you don't really even need it. Um, I mean, I found that a lot of, uh, artists in the past, inc- including some of the sort of the, the great masters of the Renaissance used tracings when they did crowd scenes, they didn't muck around, you know, arranging a whole load of models and do it, do it from life. They actually, and they, they used to swap each other's tracings. <laughs> so some of the crowd scenes look sl- slightly similar. 
it's a it's an entry trick you know it's it's something that immediately levels you up if you know that an artist sometimes uses a tracing to to get one step ahead why not use it yourself and i knew in writing that writers use a lot of of, of simple tricks that are, are, tend to be um uh, not known about and they certainly don't teach them at school and so i mean the the, the entry trick for let's say surfing is um get yourself a foam board you know a board that isn't going to hurt you when you fall off it and it hits you on the back of the head practice jumping up on top of it on top of your bed you know immediately that's going to give you because it's you know bed is slightly wobbly it will give you an advantage over someone who's trying to learn to surf in you know choppy water so these are these are little information bits of information that can immediately cause you to level level up so and and you find those usually by asking experts. They're the sort of shortcuts that they use, the the little tricks that they they know about. And the next thing is that the as I said, you need to have some payoff, some something when you've done the micro mastery, when you've surfed that wave, when you've or stood up on your surfboard, when you've cooked that omelet, people give you some feedback. So it, it, you don't want something that's just an essentially lonesome and you know doesn't have any kind of end point. And the nature of micromastery is it's small, so it's repeatable. So that's that's the other element which leads into it being gameable, by which I mean you can change the elements. And this is how you really start learning. It's not really about mindless repetition. Learning is about tweaking it, changing it, recalibrating. Mm-hmm. So with the omelets, you know, do you use one egg, two egg? How hot is the pan? How far away from the heat do you hold it? Uh, do you use oil? Do you use butter? You know, there are lots of little things that you can alter and make it gameable or, or, or experimental. It's taking an experimental approach to something that is very much broadly the same, but you can change all these elements. And so what's helpful about the entry level trick is that it feels really gratifying to learn and that gives you a boost to keep going. Another element you talk about, and I think it's kind of connected to the uh, the entry trick, is this idea. It's you call it the rub pat barrier, or like the counter yeah, the, the, counterintuitive skill. Yeah, the skill. rub pat barrier is the the point in every sk- every skill that's that's worth having. That slightly looks slightly difficult at first has this point where there are two sort of sub skills push against each other. So, I mean, if you're driving a stick shift car, there comes a point if you're learning to drive when it actually interferes with your steering because you've got to think about moving your hand down, moving the gear lever, and then and then going back to steering. And you have to coordinate these two skills. And I call it the rub pat barrier because it's rather like patting your stomach and rubbing your head or, or rubbing your stomach and patting your head. These are to coordinate those two things at once seems problematic, but you you learn how to do it. And so you identify before you even start what are these Where's the point going to be in this skill where there are two elements that pull against each other? And that's usually when people give up because they kind of think, oh, oh this is too hard. And But if you already know that's going to happen in, in advance, you can focus your energies on it. And you can use like that intro, like a, a trick basically to get over that barrier. There are often, there are often tricks that you can use to get over, get over that barrier. So for example, in the, the, the example of a kayak roll, um, you're going to have to coordinate your, 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 the hip movement of, of, uh, that you're making with the arm movement with the, with the paddle to sort of flip the boat back up. And, but if you understand that, it, that you can transmit, you're going to transmit that hip movement through your knees and, and, and your legs. You, you've actually got a kind of an advantage over somebody who really isn't quite sure what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, and you give one of the examples you give in the book that has a rub pat barrier that I'm familiar with is you, you talk about the bench press is a skill. Yeah. And the counterintuitive thing there is you think when you bench press, all you're doing is just going up. You're just pressing the bar up. Yeah. But really, if you want to do make the lift more efficient, you have to press up and back. Yeah. And like going backwards is very counterintuitive for people. That's true. I mean, the bench press is a brilliant micro mastery because at first it does look really like a, just a really simple thing, but actually there's a lot of skill and coordination involved. So, and it, and it's a very satisfying one because obviously you can boast to people <laughs> how many pounds you're lifting. Right. No. And I, I like, see, I've been, you know, lifting weights for several years now and I'm still messing with it. Cause like, I'm still 
getting over that rub pat barrier of pushing the bar back because you just want to, your, your body just wants to go up, yeah. but you need to press it back. The one that gets really, what's similar to that is the, just the shoulder press yeah. where you just, you're standing and you're just pressing it up. Like you have to press the thing backwards. Like you have to like pretend like you're going to throw the bar back behind you and you don't want to do that because you feel like, well, if I do that, like I'm going to lose control. But yeah. as soon as you do, the bar just goes up so much easier. It's a, that's a tip that's, that's worth listening to this podcast alone for that one. <laughs> <laughs> right. But, but see that, but like, that's like, it's because what you're doing when you do that is you're, you're keeping the bar over this, your center of gravity. Exactly. Yes. Cause you kind of, that's why machines are actually not very, as you know, you know, machines are just an inferior way of exercising. Cause you're, you're conforming yourself to the, to the demands of the machine rather than, you know, the most efficient way to lift that weight. Well, let's talk about this payoff thing. Cause I think that's an important, that's an important thing you hit throughout the book and you've already talked about it. Um, when you were writing about it, it made me think when I was a kid and I was, I got into magic Yeah, and the thing that like helped, you know, make become magic, like an obsession for me is I learned that one really easy trick and I was able to impress my parents and they're like, wow, that's really cool. And that made me want to do it more. And you know, what worked for you as a kid, that's still, that's still an effect today. People want to feel, you know, get recognition for acquiring new skills. It's true. I mean, because I mean, often that's the reason why people sign up for courses and go along to organized learning environments, because they're going to get that kind of attention from the teacher and the teacher will give them a pat on the back and probably the other students will, if they, if they achieve better than the average grade, but it's much easier to just uh, find things and, and identify the payoff um, without having to go through the rigmarole of doing a course in it. So um, the, the magic trick's perfect for that because, you know, of course, it's all about that that payoff. And, and in the book, I talk about the three-card trick, which is a very simple con game, but also it works as a magic trick. And you can you can show that to people and learn that quite quickly. And it's something you can do. When you say, I know a magic trick, or I'm studying magic, people are always going to ask, what can you do? Show exactly. Me, show They're me not going to say, uh, <laughs> and you tell them, oh, well, I haven't learned any tricks yet. <laughs> They're not really going to say, like explain that. to me the theory of, of magic and the psychology <laughs> yeah, of it. No, exactly. Right? Show me something. <laughs> so you, you argue that there's micro masteries in everything, cooking, weightlifting. You can usually find them. Yeah. So how do you find them? Well, I, I set myself the challenge of in the book, actually, of saying, you know, Subjects I had no interest in were lawn care and international law. And I, I thought, okay, well, now where's the challenge? Where's the micromastery? And so I, I, what you do to find it, you have to find where, where's the fun in the subject for you? Where's the exciting element for you? And then you kind of break it down. To, so for me, I thought about, you know, when, you, when, you, when I was a kid, people had these, um, uh, I mean, in, in the UK, cricket pitches that need to be rolled really flat. And, um, and often as a punishment, all the boys were, uh, given this, this task of rolling it flat, but it wasn't really a punishment. We really enjoyed doing it because it's a really heavy machine, this roller thing. So, so I, I thought, okay, then that would be the micro mastery would be to, would be to start around getting your lawn really flat and, uh, rolling. And so it sort of started, it starts from there. So look for where the fun in, in something is and then kind of build out from there. And usually that's where you can identify where it is other ways are just simply ask an expert in that field so for example in carpentry i asked this guy who's a, who's a top cabinet maker i know and he said make a perfect cube of wood because it's actually a really difficult thing to do because as soon as you cut one bits off one side it's not a perfect cube anymore and the skills you use to make a perfect cube of wood are all the skills that you need for being a good carpenter well, let's talk about, you know, it's talking to experts because that can lead you astray because oftentimes experts, their, their knowledge is tacit. Like they don't, they just know it and they have a hard time explaining it because they have the curse of knowledge. So, I mean, that's, that, that's true. And so, so sometimes you have to approach it a bit sideways and, but if you explain what I found is I explained the micro mastery concept to an expert, they usually dig one out. So I was explaining one to a sculptor and he said, make a skull out of clay don't try and sculpt a head just make a, a, a skull and then try and make a funny skull or a sad skull and so he had, he'd identified a micro mastery for sculpture so if you have an expert at your disposal you can usually explain the micro mastery idea and they will dig into their knowledge and find one for you but you're absolutely right there is a tacit element of you know this they, they don't really know what they're doing 
but well, they're not very good at explaining it. And you can see that if you go online for something like omelet making, there are certain, you know, Gordon Ramsay making an omelet is, is, is not very, uh, it, first of all, he breaks the omelets as well. <laughs> it's not a great omelet. You have to you have to poke around to find the right people. So, so it, it, I think of it as like a network of things. It's not just experts. It's you read about it, you look for hints online. You have to be have to be a bit of a researcher and and you know thing, things that catch your your eye or or, or or going back into you know things you thought were cool as a kid. Often that can be a very good starting point. Okay, so learning a micromastery skill can be a way into exploring a wider field, but they're also completing themselves. They're pleasuring themselves so that it can be the, the only skill you learn in that field. Even then, though, they motivate you to keep learning skills in other fields. But why should people even take this continual learning approach in life? Like, why learn a bunch of different disparate skills that aren't connected? Like, well, why learn how to do the kayak roll or throw a fastball or to do the perfect bench press? I and mean, what's the purpose of that? Humans are learning machines and we are, we are happy learning, even though school is trying to just beat that out of us. It is actually something we're really, we're meant to do. And, and lots of things are actually disguised learning experiences. So, you know, when you go to a new city and you're walking around, you're actually learning all the time you, about what that city is like. So, I mean, uh, uh, things like confidence. What is a confident person? A confident person is someone who isn't scared to have a go. But they know they are not scared to have a go because they know they can learn it. They have confidence in their learning ability. A lot of people who are not confident simply think they can't learn things, and they keep sticking to to what they know or the the, the limited amount of things they know. So, and there's definitely true that the more you learn, the, the better you become at it, and the more learning tactics you have, the better you become at it. So there is a kind of, you know, there's a a, a functional reason for, for for learning stuff which is that the better you are at learning, the better you are at living. But also it's, it's good to give yourself permission to be interested in anything. I think we live in a world where we're bombarded by so much information. For the first time in history, we're in, we're in a world where information is actually kind of toxic. We, we, we're turning it off. You know, we're saying no rather than yes. And I don't think that's a natural human response. Human response is to see something interesting and want to want to find out about it. That's you know for hundreds of uh, thousands of years of, of evolution. You know, interesting things meant food. They meant something important, and we should naturally kind of follow that that kind of way of being. I think, and so a micro mastery is a way to be satisfy the desire to be interested in. You can say yes to something, but you don't have to devote your entire life to it. It's really, it was for me, it was about permission to be interested in everything, which I think is normal. And it's what you like when you're a kid. When you're an adult, you, you say, oh, no, no, I haven't got time for that. No, no, I can't, I can't buy that book. Oh, I can't do that. And that's a kind of depressing way of living, I think. Right. Or, or you're told, well, you got to specialize oh, yeah. in something and make that your thing. Yeah. You know, and that becomes, every, I mean, it becomes boring. I, I Everyone... I mean, specializing sounds great because, of course, it gives you an economic advantage, and it and it comes from, from from the from the business world, really. But it's it's migrated into the human world to to our detriment. I mean, every job that is completely specialized is basically boring, and and the most interesting jobs that people want things like being a film director or an explorer, jobs that are actually polymathic they have loads of different elements well yeah i mean yeah you look back you know maybe even 100 years ago 150 like if you were a farmer like you had to know a whole bunch of different things to do your job that, that's true and i think that it is um it, 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 it's not a great thing you know more and more jobs are actually sitting as we are now <laughs> staring at a computer screen and that's uh that's not a great way to to spend your time, you know, if it's, 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 if it's the bulk of your time. So it's, you have to do something extra. And I think that that micro mastery maybe supplies that kind of extra element. I mean, if you have to earn a living, so be it, but at least have other elements there. Yeah. I was thinking about my favorite job. I mean, I might, I enjoy my job now, but one of my favorite jobs I had when I was right out of high school was I worked at the paint shop at the medical school. And we don't not only painted, and I learned how to paint. Like there's a micro mastery there, like how to how to paint an edge, right? Like that's that's a skill. But then we also like so one day I'd be like laying tile, so I learned how to do the mortar, 
right? The glue or whatever. And there's a skill there. And I, I, that whole job, that whole summer, I just acquired all these little micro masteries and you'd work on, you'd learn it and then you'd do the project for, you know, maybe two or three days. And then it was on to something else. And I learned how to, I'm trying to think of the other things. Yeah. Yeah. It's carpet. I learned how to lay carpet, cut carpet, yeah. which was amazing. You, using your knees to kick it, kick it right. in, did you? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And that was, I mean, it was just, it was a lot of fun. It was just because I was always yeah. learning something like a new discrete skill that I can, I can still bust out today. Like I can still paint an awesome edge, an awesome corner. Yeah, exactly. And, and it's, it's something that you could, that never leaves you. That's the, the other thing about micro mastery, it can't be taken away from you. And that's a really good feeling that you've, you've got, you've got these skills. And I, I think it's sad that school doesn't really do that so much. And, um, you know, you can come out of school having spent, you know, five years studying French and you can probably only say a few things, you know, it's, 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 it's kind of lamentable really. So if you're in a job that's very specialized, um, learning these varied skills can be something you do in your spare time. Pursuing these skills, besides being satisfying, besides being a confidence booster and helping you become more competent and better at life, but also it's good for your brain to constantly learn new things. As you said, like learning new things is normal for human beings. And when we, once we stop learning new things, like our brain actually deteriorates. Yeah. I mean, cognitive decay, evidence of cognitive decay is increasing in, in adults because I mean, and this is research. Uh, uh, I mean, I quote some of the leading experts into stroke recovery because I mean, stroke, how people recover from a stroke is, is measurable and it's, it shows the ability of the brain to continually grow, even in old age. We, we were, a lot of people grew up with the notion that the brain was, you know, the brain, uh, an erroneous notion that the brain had a sort of set number of cells. And, you know, once you'd learned your basic stuff, it didn't really grow anymore. We now know the brain is constantly adapting. The plastic brain is the, is the new model and you have to keep learning. It's learn it or lose it. And so that's, that in itself is an incentive. And often when I talk about micromastery and the, the audience is a bit older, this is the time when they, they suddenly start paying attention because just doing the crossword puzzle isn't, isn't really enough. There's a, a lot of evidence. You actually have to, you do have to learn stuff as you get older. And you have to, if you don't learn it, the neurotransmitters associated with learning are gradually decrease. And so you actually become unable to learn anything. I mean, I, I watched a TV program where they had this elderly elderly he was a football team manager and he he was having to learn french and he just just couldn't hold it in his head he just he would obviously hadn't done any learning he was good at managing a football team but he probably hadn't done any learning for 40 years he just couldn't do it so but the good news is starting small doing a little bit every day you build up that neurotransmitter you build up the ability to learn so that is um, a definite health benefit. So yeah, there's a case for just you know, dabbling in different things and not feeling bad. Because I think that's another thing. People are afraid to be a dabbler because you know, then you're like, you're a dilettante. It's like, well, you can't stick with anything. But the micromastery concept's like, well, I don't have to stick with it. I learned this discrete skill yeah. and that's all I need. And I'm, if, if that's all I want to learn, that's okay. That's it. And you've got something that, that you can, um, you know, it's a bit like a party piece. It, it's kind of complete in itself. It doesn't really need you to do any more you know the, the fact that you can you know get on a, get on a surfboard stand up on that surfboard and surf a wave that's enough you don't have to then devote your entire life to it or even a greater part of your life yeah like i can stack a, a great stack of wood that's all that's a discrete skill that's awesome. very useful very useful <laughs> flipping a pancake i think is a micro mastery totally that 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 sorts out the men from the boys definitely the, the people who who go for it and the others who, who kind of mess it up and it ends up on the on the taps or the on the stove or something. yeah uh, you have in here like splitting a log is another one um, yeah which yeah there's a skill to it there's a trick and once you learn the trick or even like yeah splitting a log like i've what was the, the the thing there is you you want to let the the mall do all the work oftentimes people want to just swing as hard as they can that's not the trick yeah yeah i mean if you you're right and if you see people who like native native people often women chopping wood the the, the the axe or the machete does all the work they, they, they're just letting it drop really and but the other one i love it because i put this in the book is the is it's a skill that's actually gone because everyone has chainsaws but the actual chopping a log in half rather than splitting it and if you watch and often in movies they get this wrong 
the, 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 you just they just sort of like viciously go at a kind of V at the, in, in the log. And of course, eventually, uh, you have to start chopping at each side to widen the V. Whereas the correct way is you you make two 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 cuts that are the width of the log apart, and then a, and then you kind of angle the axe so that chip just flies out. You you actually get rid of a big lump of wood, and um, it's a, it's it's miles faster. And that is the, that is the traditional and correct way of chopping a log. So that's a kind of skill that really impresses people. It does impress people. You had the section about how the punk rock scene like in the 70s and 80s, can teach us something about micromastery. So I was like, in the 90s, I was like a punk rocker. Like, what, the punk, like as punk rock, you could be in like suburban Oklahoma, which is probably not very punk rock. <laughs> but um, there is an ethos there that I think does apply to this micromastery concept. Uh, definitely, it's, it's the have a go ethos you know basically in the 70s you know the music had been become really bloated and you had these huge super groups and then suddenly a whole bunch of guys in garages said oh well we, we can't even play instruments but we want to be we want to be pop stars and so they would construct them the simplest kind of songs and and even I, I, I read the other day Sid Vicious the reason he started his pogo dancing is he couldn't dance <laughs> so he just started, in frustration just started jumping up and down and, and, and invented a new dance so it's that willingness to have a go and punk uh, rockers, you know, they made, they did their own recording. They often set up their own record companies. They had their own fanzines. They were, they were willing to do, have a go at everything. And, and, it, and it took over and created a whole movement in music that eventually the conventional record companies got on board with. And the, the, an interesting modern day example is the, I don't know if you have this bit craft beer in America, but in the UK it's huge. It's called Brewdog. And the, the founder of Brewdog actually wrote a book call, calling his book a, a punk businessman because he, he, um, he'd grown up with punk rock and that idea of doing everything, in his case, brewing the beer in his garage when he started, doing the marketing, going out to the get the money from the bank, bottling it, all of these things he was willing to have a go at. He wasn't, he wasn't trying to outsource it to specialists. And that gave him a much bigger control and, and a much bigger... Um, ability to do it cheaply because i mean the, the moment you start asking experts to do things for you, you you're just going to be writing checks left right and center right now that was the like I, that's what I, one thing that i enjoyed about that the punk rock scene was you know if you wanted to do a show well you just like you rented out an american legion hall and you made your own crappy flyers at Kinko's, yeah. you handed them out, and then you made your own cassette tapes that you know didn't sound great, but like you just did it. Like you, you weren't afraid to put it out there. You just, yeah, as you said, give it a go, and I, I, I like that a lot. Why did you give up in the end? <laughs> I think I just outgrew it. Like I mean, I, I, I was never like in a punk band. I just went to the shows and, and listened. I, I, I think I outgrew. I mean, I still, I still carry that ethos with me. I'm just like, I'm just gonna do this. I'm gonna give it a go. But I mean, what's crazy too is it's, I think things are a lot easier now to give it a go. But you're, you're right. It, it, it is actually never been easier to do, to do a lot of these things. And you have like YouTube videos that could show you how to do things. Like, yeah. I mean, you didn't have that 20, 30 years ago. Yeah. It was really difficult. Even fixing my, I mean, I fixed my car the other day, replacing some broken tail lights. I would never have done that in the past because it, it did involve removing a couple of, of, you know, bumper panels in the right order. But the video you know, six minute video on YouTube, ordered the parts on eBay for, you know, minimal sum, saved myself probably two or three hundred dollars. So it's a, it's, you know, it's fantastic in a way. So yeah, I think the, 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 the idea there, we think we started talking about, start talking about punk rockers is like, just don't be afraid to give it a try and just, just go for it. And it might, you might, you might mess up a lot in the beginning. It might be terrible, but if you find that micro mastery skill in the, that thing you want to learn, because it's repeatable, because it's self-contained, you can easily master it. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's a painless way of uh, approaching something. And I think that, I've mentioned this before, we now go through life with these kind of, our mindset to know. Like when you're walking down a crowded, an empty street, uh, a crowded street, you, you're basically not open because if you were, you know, panhandlers or, you know, people might get in your way or whatever. So you're, you're more or less saying no to, to life. But of course... That isn't the normal human response. Normally, we, we, we're supposed to be open and interested in things. So this is a way of, of getting around that kind of no 
barrier that we've had to erect around ourselves to get through life. So we've been talking about micro masteries in the abstract, why they're great, why you should develop them and the benefits of it. But can you, can you walk us through like a micro mastery um, that you've enjoyed that can give us a taste of what we're talking about here? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the first one, which is, which I've spoken about several times, which is the omelet making is, I think it's, it's satisfying because, because it's such an easy thing to do. And the entry trick, which I picked up from a French cook was, uh, if you want to immediately make the omelets fluffier, which will get a response. And, and this isn't the classical way to make an omelet, but it is a way to to immediately get that payback is to separate out the egg white and the egg yolk and beat that white a lot and then recombine them later, you will get a much, much fluffier omelet. So immediately you've got this entry trick skill and the acknowledgement that when you're making a, an omelet in the past, I would just sort of put them straight into the pan. I didn't realize that the, the, the whole kind of rub pat barrier, if you like in making omelets is that is to do with the heat of the, the heat of the pan and how much you kind of agitate the omelet mix. Cause in, in, in fact, an omelet is actually closer to scrambled eggs than people think they think it's more like a pancake, but it really, if you've got the model of kind of scrambled eggs in your mind, that's, that's kind of closer. So the simple way around that, that barrier is, don't mess around with the the gas control on the oven. Just lift the pan up and down, you know, and, and learn how to control the heat in the pan by just the distance it is from the flames. So it's another very, very simple kind of trick that enables you to get around that problem of, of, of you know, the, the correct heat of the, of the, uh, of, of what the pan should be. And there are all sorts of, you know, like the classical way to make an omelet is to use a, a fork, which at first seems like, you know, people are, you know, use you know spatulas and so on, but a fork is a is a really good piece of of equipment for cooking a, an omelet because you can add, you can keep agitating the, the the mix in the pan and that builds it up and makes it much fluffier. And then when it comes to tipping it out, you can use the the fork to gradually roll up the omelet because in the, in the classical omelet you roll it up when you dump it out. And another entry trick which which uh, which isn't so widely known is that it's almost impossible to undercook an omelet, but it's, it's, it's very, very, and this is why it's, it's a test piece. It's very, very easy to overcook one and just make it like rubber. So once you know that it's always much better to err on the side of undercooking. And, um, because once you've rolled that omelet up, it often, it will keep cooking. So you, you don't really need to worry. So, you know, with that information, you should, uh, should be able to cook some pretty, pretty good omelets. <laughs> right. But you, but you said that like, you know, even though you've got those entry tricks down, like you're still tweaking with it, like you're still experimenting with it. Like it's not, it doesn't stop. It, it, it can stop there if you want, but it, it doesn't necessarily have to. It doesn't because, because you're, you're kind of interested in the process and it, you want to, you want to improve, you know, and you, you, um, you want to um, experiment. I think that's a sort of natural, natural human thing to want to do. And it, this is all what, what I think this micro mastery concept does is you're learning how to learn again, which is becoming a skill that is essential in today's world where, you know, skills are constantly upgrading and changing. So like what you were able to u- do to get ahead in life or make a living, you know, is might not be relevant 10, 15 years from now. So you have to know how to learn. And this micro mastery concept is a way to, to learn how to learn. Yeah, exactly. And, um, yeah, no, it's absolutely true. I mean, in my own, uh, career, I, I, I earned money as a journalist and, uh, you know, pretty good money as freelance journalist. That's pretty much dried up. Um, obviously there are, are a few magazines and newspapers that are still going, but vast amounts of that revenue now goes to Facebook. So, you know, the people, people who are journalists have got to learn something new. And if you're not prepared to learn something new, well, you're not going to, you're not going to earn a living. <laughs> right. Well, Robert, where can people go to learn more about the book and your work? So, yeah, I mean, the books on Amazon, in fact, most of my books are on Amazon. So you can get them there or from Barnes and Noble, uh, those websites. And I also have a website, which is a, a blog and it has a, a lot of articles. It probably has nearly a thousand articles on it. 
um, and that's robertwigger.com. So that's covers a whole range of, 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 of subjects, but uh, yeah, you can dig around in there and there's, there's more on micro mastery. There's more on some of the traveling I've done and various other things I've, I've, I've been involved in. Well, fantastic. Robert Twigger, thanks for your time. I'm going to go, I'm going to go make an omelet now. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. My guest today was Robert Twigger. He's the author of the book, Micromastery. It's available on amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. You can find out more information about his work at his website, Robert Twigger. It's Twigger with two G's. Dot com. Also check out our show notes at aom.is slash micromastery, where you can find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic. 